family and a home, all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. The Elias and Sally Landis family had its home in Lower Salford Township, in the fertile land just below their spiritual home, the Salford Mennonite Meeting House. Here a family of faith had been gathering since 1717 to bear witness to the great faithfulness of God. But our family story has its true beginning further down the slope in the Branch Creek Valley behind the homestead. Where the old Goshenhoppen Road, running from Skipack Township up toward the ridge, would ford the Branch Creek, pioneer Gerhard Clemens built a grist mill. Its foundation of 1726 remains today a little upstream from what would later be called Groff's Mill. Gerhard Clemens had three sons. His oldest, John, was the miller and Gerhardt built a house for him beside the mill, presently the home of Bill and Mary Ann Harris. Access to the mill was critical for the area's farmers, so naturally there was a road connecting it with the Maxitani Road, which would eventually become Harleysville's main street. This old road, today an overgrown farm lane, was one of the township's earliest and most important thoroughfares. Gerhardt Clemens was one of the largest landholders of Lower Salford, 136 acres, Bisected by that old road and just below the meeting house were granted in 1736 to his son Jacob. The house there may well have been built ten years before at the same time as his brother John's. The house and farm remained in the Clemens family for five generations until the time of Isaac Clemens, a preacher at Salford. This means that for 168 years the Elias and Sally Landis family home had been in fact a Clemens homestead. In 1887 Minister Isaac Clemens sold the farm to Elias R. Landis. Elias' father, Abraham D. Landis, lived in a home on what is presently Tyson Road. So the home of one of Gerhard Clemens's sons became the Landis homestead of our story. But the other side of our story, the Oldifers, also had its beginnings back at the Clemens Mill. John Clemens sold the mill and house in 1764 to Frederick Aldifer who turned it over to his son, John. In 1807, one of John's sons, Abraham, settled on the acreage just across the creek from the old mill. This farm passed into the hands of Abraham's eighth child, Jacob, who died unexpectedly in 1880. Shortly after his death, his 12-year-old son sketched the Aldifer house and barn. The boy with this artistic inclination was Philip Grant Aldifer, later known as Pappy Aldifer, the youngest of 14 children. Philip attended the Gargas School and remembered friendly times there with his buddy, Clayton Aldifer. Through Philip was passed down a ceramic cat, a gift, it is said, to his parents, Jacob and Susanna, at their wedding in 1847. At the age of 16, Philip worked as a hired man on the farm of his sister Annie Clemens near Lederock, where he painted this picture. In 1887, Philip began courting a Salford girl, Katie Moyer, daughter of preacher Jacob C. Moyer. Katie lived along present-day Route 113 in what is currently the home of Dr. Durstein, but her father also owned a farm behind them facing Landis Road. This was originally the homestead of pioneer Frederick Aldifer, who had bought the mill and the house from Gerhard Clemens for his son John. It was here that Philip and Katie settled after marrying in 1889. At that time, their parents each just thought the Mennonite people were Worcester farmers. And they thought all their sons should be farmers. And my father never was a good farmer. He would have been a better painter, a carpenter. 
Sally Aldifer, born in 1899, was the fifth of Katie and Philip's seven children. Things that we looked forward so much, that were so much fun, and we wanted to go barefoot so bad. And my mother used to say, you go up to Grandma Moore, if she tells you, you can go barefoot it. So we were glad to go where the field was just one field to go to grandparents. And uh, so, so we came back happy the year she could. We didn't have expensive toys. We had most of the rag dolls, not the nice dolls they have now. And we played church and we had wagons and played tag. And uh, we had also had a playhouse in the corn crib, which was very exciting when it rained. We had the cars out grazing the fields, and our job was to see that they stayed in the field. So we had a dog that usually, usually helped us to get the cars in. We said, Daisy, get the cars, and he went around the field and helped us get the cars in. Sally walked a little over a mile to Alderfer School near Harleysville, close to where Oak Drive meets Main Street. The first year of school was really exciting. We went real early. So we always saw that we had a good rag to clean the slate, and, uh, and the bottle was a sprinkler on to mm-hmm. clean the slate. We didn't go by grades, uh, we went by readers. Then some children in our school, they came the first day, then they didn't come till the corn was husked, till the corn was away. I enjoyed my school days very much and often wished I could go longer, not too many. Graduated at that time, and uh, the trolley used to run from Harlesville to Norristown. So we walked up to the pike and went to Norristown to our dentist. And then when shopping the five and ten, I think that's all we could afford. I remember walking to Harlesville to Metzger's to have our picture taken. In 1917, at about the time of this picture, Sally was baptized at Salford in a membership class that included Elias and Landis. About the same year that Sally was born, a photograph was taken of Elizabeth Reif Landis, great-grandmother of Elias Landis. Elizabeth, married to Abraham Detweiler Landis, lived on the farm they had bought along Tyson Road. The tenth of their thirteen children, was Elias R. Landis, who bought the Clemens homestead from Minister Isaac Clemens. Alice Landis married Elizabeth Keller Landis, whom the family called Mommy Landis. Alice and Elizabeth had only one child, Abraham L. Landis, born in 1874 and later called Pappy Landis. Abram married Emma Shoemaker Nice, Mammy Landis. Abram and Emma were the parents of Elias Nice Landis. In 1896, when Abraham and Emma were married, it was common for young people of Mennonite families to dress quite fashionably until they were married and joined the church. The strongest emphasis on plain dress in the church wouldn't come for about another 20 years. Abram and Emma lived on the farm with his parents, Alice and Elizabeth. The oldest of their five children was Elias Nice Landis. Elias attended the Meeting House School just beside the Salford Meeting House. His classmates there included many of the neighboring Clemens and Grove children. His doggone good tablet shows carefully worked and almost always correct algebra lessons, and his report card from 1913, signed by his father Abram, shows especially high marks in reading and literature. Elias had four brothers and sisters. Three years younger was Katie, also on this school picture, Then came Lizietta, seven years younger. An infant brother, John, died at three months. Willa, 16 years younger than Elias, was the baby. Lizietta, here with sister Katie, had a problem with her eye as a baby. It was sore, like babies had sore eyes sometimes, so the doctor told them what to do, and it was too strong, and it ate skin and all off. So I was in the hospital. Well, it was 15 months and four years and six years for the eye. Then when I was 29, then it had to come out. Unlike his future wife, Elias was able to complete eight grades of schooling and gave a recitation on the occasion of his commencement. There were plenty of friends for Elias nearby. The Landis boys from the farm across the creek where Philip Alderfer grew up and the Groves living in what had been Miller John Alderfer's house. A special friend was Clayton Grove. Together he and Elias spent many hours swimming or skating at the branch or in the mill. There must have been at least one trip to the shore, according to this picture of Ryan Grove, Elias, and Jacob Grove. In 1916, Elias's father bought his first car, a Chevrolet they called the 490, for that's how much it cost. This car had 15,000 miles on when sold, Lizietta wrote. It seemed to be worn out. Maybe there was a trip as far as Lancaster for Katie and little Willis. 
and for 19-year-old Elias, it meant he and his girlfriend Sally Aldifer didn't always have to travel by horse and buggy. The first evening, we went to the lawn social in Skibag. <laughs> there was nothing especially going on. It was a place to go. Our wedding was, we went to Franconia to a bishop, Abram Clammer, mm -hmm. and we got married and we went home and that was it. It lasted all those years. After their wedding in 1918, Elias and Sally set up housekeeping in the home of Elias's parents. At the far left was the woodshed, attached to the summer kitchen, with the outhouse behind. The house was divided into two parts. Living in the larger part on the left were Abram, Emma, their children, and Emma's nephew, Garrett Nice. Elias's grandparents, Aylis and Elizabeth, or Mommy Landis, lived on the right. Lizietta, here with good friend Sally Mae Clemmer, lived with her parents, but would go to help out in the homes of families with new babies. Willis was only five when Elias brought Sally to live in their home. Sister Katie was married the year after Elias was to Jacob Moyer, but died the following year. The farm was a 180-year-old collection of additions, lean-tos, and outbuildings. The long lane passed by the upper end of the barn on its way down the slope toward the mill. Directly in front of the barn stood a pig pen, and beside that, the manure pile. Standing beneath the overshoot and looking toward the house, one could see that a butcher house had been added to the summer kitchen. Manure from the barn was carried out to the pile on a cable strung to a post. It must have been a busy farm in the World War I years, and Elias was draft age. In October 1918, after being married four months, he received a 2C classification and deferment. Not so for Sally's sister Lizzie's new husband, Harry Heckler, who died of the flu at Camp Mead, Maryland, on their first wedding anniversary. In September 1918, Elias got down to the serious business of farming and record-keeping. Accounts for that year show an income of $79.34 from the sale of chickens and eggs. $62.16 was spent on grain and feed from the likes of Abram Grove, nearby Miller, and Manassas Clemens, owner of the feed mill in Harleysville. Elias had a family to support beginning with daughter Emma, and followed by Curtis and Abram. Sally and Elias would have these three children by 1924, while still living in the large side of the house with Mammy and Pappy Landis, Lizietta and Willis. That was the year also that a call went out to the Salford congregation. We solicit your aid in the erection of our new meeting house, which is to cost about $15,000. The new brick meeting house, with its long porch facing the graveyard, would replace the building that had stood since 1850. Young Elias and Sally contributed $100, while Elias's father, Aylis, gave 500 The following year, 1925, Aylis Landis died. Young Emma and Kurt, on the right, would now move with their parents to the smaller side of the house, while widowed Mommy Landis moved in with daughter-in-law Emma and grandson Willis. Elias was certainly busy with farm work in those years, he kept careful record of what was planted, where, how it was cultivated, weather conditions, and what the yields were. It's evidence of someone who took farming seriously with every intention of supporting his young family by devotion to his work. By 1928, with the birth of Betty, there were four children, and the family must have felt well established in their farm life. But it was to be a year that would set their lives on a new course. Salford at that time had two ministers. Sally's minister grandfather, Jacob C. Moyer, had died seven years earlier, leaving 79-year-old Henry Clemmer and Ryan Aldifer the first English preaching minister at Salford. In accordance with tradition, lots were cast for the selection of a new minister. Among the four in the lot were Melvin Aldifer, Sally's brother, and her 31-year-old husband, Elias. Four slips of paper were placed in Bibles, three of them blank, and one with this verse from Proverbs, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. When Elias, choosing last, selected the Bible with the verse, it was a feeling Sally said she would never forget. The boys cried when they heard their father had been chosen, since they knew they wouldn't be able to sit with him in the pulpit. But that was only a small part of what it meant to be a minister of a large congregation like Salford. I would have liked to just leave everything and go to school for a while, Elias wrote later, but that was too much for our older people at the time. It would have been too much for his young family as well. Soon after the ordination, member Isaac Durstein told Elias, since the Lord called you as a minister, you can just open your mouth. Old Henry Clemmer was a better help, telling Elias to say what he could, then let Henry finish for him. 
For his first words from the pulpit, Elias read the hymn, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Of course, the demands of the farm didn't let up. Curtis had a lamb to tend, perhaps after coming home from the meeting house school, which he attended with Sister Emma, until it was closed following the township consolidation in 1936. The family continued to grow with Melvin, Sarah Catherine, and Doris June. By the time the eighth child, Elias Jr., was born in 1935, the family had moved from the smaller side of the house into the larger left-hand side. Betty, with her doll, and Doris now had four bedrooms to find a place to sleep in. Mom would come around at night to be sure everyone was covered, since it could get pretty cold in the back bedrooms in the winter. The other side of the house was now home to Abram and Emma Landis, Lizietta, Willis, and Abram's mother Elizabeth. Mommy Landis lived with her great-grandchildren until she was 91 years old. Pappy and Mammy Landis continued to farm, and Pappy would go to market at Ridge Avenue. Emma graduated from Lower Salford School in Harleysville and would soon go on to a long career of teaching Bible school, as here with cousin Dorothy Landis at Salford. In 1936, the family received a tremendous shock. Three-year-old Doris complained of pain in her hip, which was diagnosed as tuberculosis. But she made a miraculous recovery in which everyone involved felt the hand of the Lord at work. Lizietta worked for a time at a hosiery mill in Souderton, and continued to help some families with housekeeping, but found time for an occasional trip, like this one to Niagara Falls. Elias's role as minister kept him busy with weddings, starting with his nephew Earl Aldifer in 1936, the first of 34 he would perform, most of them at his home. In the following year, 1937, the ninth child Mary Jane was born, and the family began a new enterprise. November 3, 1937, opening day at the 69th Street Market, Upper Darby. Elias's account book for that day shows what was sold, honey, apple butter, noodles, pot pie, butter, mush, chicken, cakes, 34 dozen eggs, for a grand total of $38.04. That was a Wednesday. Saturdays were busier. The E.N. Landis billhead would come to symbolize the family's livelihood for the next 12 years. It was a family operation. Emma was 18 when the stand opened, Abe and Betty joined in, Melvin began helping at 12, and Mammy Landis helped make sausage. The market manager asked Elias to sell beef as well as pork, so he started with a quarter of beef before beginning to slaughter for himself. The second anniversary flyer told the story. Our beef killed right on our farm. Forty-five years' experience in Pennsylvania Dutch sausage and scrapple making. Three generations to wait on you. Our motto, the golden rule. Elias and Sally may well have reflected in 1938 on the blessings of raising a family and working together on a farm. At the same reunion, Sally posed with her siblings, Jacob, Susan, Louis, Lizzie, and Melvin. The farm was always the center of some kind of activity. Kurt might entertain Abe and the Neckles with a possum, and Abe might visit with the cousins Paul Landis and the other Abe Landis. And of course, a thriving farm and market business meant lots of work. There to join in the family life was Peter Moyer, eight-year-old son of Dr. Paul Moyer of Lansdale. For four summers, he came to live with the family and became so close to Melvin that he said if Melvin died, he wanted to die too. But there was always plenty of life to encourage and feed and provide the family's livelihood. And how could that many children help but have a good time, whether at the beach like Junior, Cass, Doris, Betty, and Melvin and Pete in the back, or lined up for winter fun, Betty with Mary Jane on her back, Melvin, Cass, Doris, and Junior. Everyone needs to find something to hold. Melvin has a puppy, and are those Lizietta's dolls? Of course, while all this play was going on, Sally had to be looking after the needs of a family now numbering 10 with the birth of Ruth. Lizietta did as much as anyone to help raise her nieces and nephews. Work on the farm continued to increase as the children were able to help more and the market business expanded. During the World War II years, a farm was assigned points for the number of turkeys raised, which determined whether or not family members were eligible for farm deferments. This became a particular issue around the time of this picture with Abram, Elias, Melvin, Pete Moyer, Little Junior, and Curtis. Curtis was then working as a helper in his uncle I.T. Landis's plumbing business. 
The boy, Elias wrote to the draft board, always would rather stay at home and work on the farm, but because of our responsibility in supporting ten children and parents, something had to be done. There is no question we do not have enough work on our farm with another boy and two small ones to take care of this work. I, as a minister, would not like to do anything that would spoil our Christian witness. I would like to hear if I should keep this boy home on the farm. Kurt and Abram both did receive deferments and spent the war years on the farm. Government regulation and restrictions enforced during the war were a major complication and could make it hard to do business. A market customer wrote complaining of the amount of fat he found inside a rolled roast. Received your letter of complaint, Elias wrote back, about the roast you bought from us. It hath so shocked me that working ever since goes hard. I hope that the Price Administration will make some adjustment on beef soon, so that we can stay in business and support our family of twelve, and also that we may continue to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, of which I am an ordained minister, working as an unsalaried minister with a congregation of 375 members. The church did acknowledge the financial burden it created, as shown by this note, with $200 in the collection box at Christmas and Elias and Sally appreciated any small assistance from the community, such as a deduction on their dentist bill for Betty and Curtis. In 1943, Susan, the eleventh child, was born, and in 1944, the year that Abram married Grace Delp, James, the last of the twelve children, arrived. There was a twenty-five-year age difference between little Jim and the oldest child, Emma. She was off in the summer to teach Bible school as part of a mission outreach Elias had established in Maine. Everyone from oldest to youngest had a role on the farm. Week of April 8, 1946, potatoes, 32 bags, blue bantam peas, onions, carrots, and beets. Week of April 15, plowed field along hill and lower half of back of house, sowed in oats. Planted tomatoes, week of May 20, six acres. June 6, planted corn along Branch Hill. That same year, 1946, Mammy found Pappy on the kitchen floor dead of a heart attack at age 71. Their old style of dress and that of their parents now seemed like costume to the generation of grandchildren Junior, Doris, Cass, and Melvin. But the experience of living with grandparents as family would not die away. Elias and Sally took a long trip next year with Sally's sister Susan and husband I.T. Landis. In four weeks, they covered almost 10,000 miles traveling north to visit Linford Hackman's, and on through Oregon, California, New Mexico, and Kansas. Fields and crops were, of course, of great interest to the Pennsylvania farmer. While they were gone, one of the homestead's great features appeared, the playhouse built by Pappy Aldifer and brother-in-law Louis Moyer from the remains of an old chicken house. This was of great interest to the youngest children, Susan, Mary Jane, Ruthie, and Jim, as it would be to their children and a host of cousins. And now there were four generations again, as Barbara, the first grandchild, sat with her father, grandfather, and great-grandmother Emma. There would be a quick succession of marriages, as Betty, Curtis, and Melvin found mates and were married by their father. Their weddings were probably not as fancy as the one Elias performed for twins Mary and Martha Landis at the home of their parents, Levi and Fanny, in 1949. After Levi Landis' nephew Paul moved to Kentucky, Sally and Elias went for a visit, riding horseback through the hollers. They braved a precarious footbridge with preacher Ryan Aldifer's daughter Caroline and Paul's mother Lizzie, and marveled at such foreign crops as a field of cotton. Church-related visiting was only one of the demands on a minister and his wife. Elias and Sally felt a great burden for the work of young people in mission outreach. In 1949, Elias preached a dedication sermon at Spring Mount, which held summer Bible schools well before Salford had them. Elias and Sally encouraged the work at Finland, Easton, and Steel City, and continued to push for increased involvement in New England, making frequent trips to Maine and Vermont. At the same time, the market business, now in its twelfth year, continued to grow. Doris, Emma, Betty, and Melvin were all there to help, but still Elias couldn't just stay off to the side. 
accounts for 1948 show expenses of $130,000 for livestock and meats, as well as other expenses totaling $141,000. Total income from market sales, as well as turkeys, hides, bones, and fat, was $145,000, a difference of only $4,400. Elias was past 50 now, and it was his great desire to give more, if not all of his time, to the work of the church. And Abram was anxious to establish himself in business. So in 1949, Elias sold the market business to his 25-year-old son, and E. N. Landis became A. A. Landis, with Emma Mel and Doris, now working for their brother. There were changes in the landscape of the farm as well, some of them resulting from the expanding market business. The lane now came in front of the house, rather than circling around the upper end of the barn. The engine room attached to the barn, where the butchering was first done, was torn down, as was the large pig pen that stood in front of the barn. Now there was a clear view across the barnyard to the house from the upper end of the barn, where some corn stood ready to be put away. Eventually, the barn was prepared to be covered with asbestos shingles, giving it the look it would have as long as it continued to stand. These improvements were made while farming and the market business were reaching their peak in this community. Mammy Landis hoed behind a new four-car garage with a shop upstairs, built near the corn crib. The barn was the focus of much activity, work and play. The house too received its share of attention and renovation, though one could hardly say modernization. Bathrooms were installed on the second floor, allowing the outhouses to be torn down. Likewise the woodshed attached to the kitchen on the tenant side when that was fixed up. The wooden porch floor was replaced with concrete. The shop or butcher house was expanded and a walk-in refrigerator added. Slaughtering more beef demanded a more efficient operation, so another building was added with a holding pen and a fenced chute to bring steers down from the barn. After being hung and bled, the beef was pushed along a suspended track to the butcher shop. Behind the house, on the other side of the little run, were the turkey pens. From the barn roof, increased activity could be seen up around the quarry. Jim, Ruthie, Cass, Doris, Junior, Mary, and Susan gathered on the cave wall. Though in the days before refrigeration such a cellar had been a necessity, by now it was enough of a novelty to be an attraction to Sunday visitors, though there were others. Much family activity focused on the market business, which continued to provide an outlet for the farm's production. Every person had some role and could make some contribution. Elias was by now primarily providing the facility for an operation run by Abe and the other children. The market business paid Elias rent for the shop and related expenses such as electricity and laundry as well as wages. The family was supported in large part at the time by the wages of the working children, all of which were turned over to their father. The house was filled to bursting with life and activity. Mom and Pop, Emma and Cass, Doris, Junior, Mary, Ruthie, Susan and Jim on one side, Mammy and Lizietta on the other. If you could find just a little space or make a little room at a table, that would do. Fortunately, Elias had his study through the door on the right to do his sermon preparation. As the older children married, such as Curtis to Betty Mae Hackman, attended by Melvin and future wife Esther Aldifer, they looked for places near the homestead to settle their families. De Versammling Lane, the meeting house lane leading out toward the Harleysville Road was made into a proper road, and the children began to build houses around the edge of the farm. Kurt's home-to-be was built in 1952 out at the end of the lane to the right, and Abrams the same year in the trees off to the left, alongside the old road up past the meeting house. In time, five of the children would build within sight of their birthplace. Now the family could gather at Abe and Grace's home in the woods for Christmas gift-giving. Royden seems to be as amused or confused as Mammy by her gift. The value of closeness to grandparents and extended family could now be experienced by the next generation. Jim would grow up just down the lane from his niece Barbara. Mel and Esther could bring their family across the fields to visit Mom and Pop and feel the love in a house full of family. Yes, it might get noisy and a little confusing at times, but in that case you could just tune it out. 
For Sally and Elias, the farm was a gift from God, a place where they were able to carry out their greatest mission in life, providing a Christian home for their 12 children. It was a place where all its members could contribute toward its happiness. For a minister and his wife, work and support of the church was likewise a calling of God. This might involve a trip with Willard and Catherine Schisler to Goshen for a Sunday school convention, or to Maine for cottage Bible school meetings. Emma was much involved in these mission and teaching efforts, and it must have given her parents great pleasure when in 1952 she volunteered for a two-year term of service in Puerto Rico. The next year, Elias and Sally, with friends David and Mabel Durstein, paid her a visit. This is Wednesday noon, after we had breakfast in our cabin. Mrs. Durstein is chief cook, David is supervisor. Sometimes we listen and sometimes we change it, because that's the way we agreed when we left, that we must get along together. And praise the Lord, that's what we're doing. Yes, sir. Between Amen. Amen. <laughs> Tuesday, we went horseback riding down over the mountain into the valley. You should have saw that. <laughs> Where they are building a Mennonite church. I would rather go on an airplane than down that mountain. That's for sure. How about you, Dave? You bet every time. <laughs> and the worst part of it was it rained. Of course, I was soaked and wet by this time. But you don't notice it so much here in Puerto Rico. The rain isn't so wet here as it is in Pennsylvania. But it is wet. At least it don't seem so. After we got down, David said, I'm pretty nervous, but this is too much for me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This was almost too much for the grandpops. <laughs> and uh, after we got back up, Chris Graber said that if we'd have to do this, we'd convert the people all on one trip. Amen to that. Get on the valley and be done, Mrs. <laughs> Junior, you should see these men together. They're just like a couple of high school boys. <laughs> We told them when they came That's down. That's talking, Junior. And we didn't know how long we were going to keep them, just according how they behave. They're doing pretty good, but as soon as they get a little hard to handle, well, we'll get their reservations made so they get out of here. <laughs> we're doing right good. Uh, Happy birthday, Junior. Who's going to bake your cake if Mom isn't there? <laughs> oh, Kathy. Kathy will bake a cake for him. I guess he'll have a wonderful time. If not, you can buy one once in a while. <laughs> Hi, Scrammy and you Andy. Yes, hi, it's Mammy. Yeah, yeah. Mammy, Mammy. Tell Mammy we sure run up in the air. Listen, Ella, uh, Mrs. DuPont said aside, and you think that's from the DuPont Flower Gardens? That made your mom feel good. Sitting aside of a millionaire on an airplane, <laughs> 13,000 feet up in the air. What do you think of that? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Junior. Happy birthday to you in Puerto Rico. Back home, Junior was seeing Glenda Gottschall, and before long would be adding his family to the literally extended table. Aunt Lizzie Heckler and Pappy Oliver were often part of the group. At one Christmas gathering, Kurt's ability at the pump organ seems to be of some question to Ruthie. And Jim, Betty, Susan, and Mel share Abe's surprise at a present. Mel had by now gotten a camera and would soon take a series of pictures that would be some of the family's finest. Joe Weber and Abe put a new metal door on the cave. Elias and Sally whitewashed the wall around the rock garden. Mammy is certainly unaware that Mel has a camera as she comes in from the patch to have her hoe sharpened. And Tim is the only one who seems to notice as his father talks to Pappy Oliver. Tim can certainly learn to work when he sees everyone else doing it. And the girls are learning something as they play house. Ruthie, Eileen Grove, Susan, Susan Moyer, Mary Jane Moyer, and Loretta Grove. Ruthie, Susan, and Jim would walk up the lane from the bus stop on Grove's Mill Road, coming home from the Franconia Mennonite School. And at some time in the evening, before sleep overcame them, they would have to find time for homework, though Jim seems to be losing the battle. Mel and that camera. Can't anybody even eat breakfast in peace? Mary Jane enjoyed one more birthday at home with her family. It wouldn't be long, though, till she and Bob Berge would bring back little ones of their own to take her place. The butcher shop crew enjoyed, or at least we think they enjoyed, a deep sea fishing expedition. Elias caught a 24-inch, six-pound bluefish, 
and Sally couldn't get him to take his cap off for the picture. The trouble with a catch like that was that somebody had to clean it. Melvin sneaked around the smokehouse to catch Mom in the act. Everyone seems happy with what's on the table, and who wouldn't be? Baked and fried fish, coleslaw, dill and sweet pickles, celery, creamed potatoes, graham crust with chocolate pudding, and pastry crusts with strawberries. Food for the body and food for the soul. We mustn't forget the spiritual nourishment Elias helped to provide for the Salford congregation. One day in 1952 found him and two of the girls at a neighboring farm auction shortly before preaching a sermon on Mission Sunday. Beloved, this morning as I look over our congregation, and I was trying to figure that maybe we have close to 100 who are under 20 years of age in the Salford congregation. And I feel that our responsibility for feeding these lambs of the fold. Isn't it wonderful how important it is that we should take care of the flock of God to feed the lambs, to tend the sheep, and to feed the sheep. Beloved, maybe some of you are not concerned about your young people, but oh, what are we going to do in the future? Are we going to preserve our doctrine of non-resistance and non-conformity, the two doctrines that our churches stand and build upon? Are we going to lose them? Elias was much concerned with the doctrine of non-resistance. In that same sermon, he reported traveling 11,000 miles, largely on visits to boys in the CPS camps. He reported 1,300 miles at one point, but no time, as that belongs to the Lord and will be taken care of. 1954 brought Emma back from Puerto Rico. Everyone piled into a Hagee's bus to pick her up at the Newark airport and bring her home to her family. Emma was still wearing the black veil typical of Mennonites in Puerto Rico. Later that year, she would begin her long career as chief cook at the new Christopher Dock High School. Within one month that year, Elias would marry and Sally would greet two of their children, Doris and Richard at Salford, and Elias Jr. and Glenda at Rock Hill, who cared for two children while in 1W service in New York. Jim and Susan had plenty of playmates on the farm that summer. Their parents were asked by the Fresh Air Fund of New York City to help the program get established in their community. The second year, 163 children were brought to the Franconia area and placed in local homes. When it comes to mission work, wrote Elias, my wife and I have stuck our necks out many a time and have received blessings from God superabundantly. Betty Burford spent time on the farm that summer and would agree that the love and acceptance some of these children felt among the Landis family stayed with them for a lifetime. Getting to know their grandfather and great-grandfather were Jim, Tim, Barb with Philip, Susan with Mike, Alice Marie, and Steve. And Mammy might come over from her side to marvel with them at the tape recorder. Lizietta was there as always, when Betty's Richard needed help at the pump. Family ties reached out to larger circles as well. Elias had a great interest in genealogy and was active in the Moyer, Landis, and Nice family associations, even to the point of hosting reunions. Though the landscape was primarily rural, there were signs of change. Where once there were only fields, a crop of homes would spring up. Perhaps there was a connection with the coming of the northeast extension of the turnpike in 1955, calling forth a mountain of crushed stone from the nearby quarry. New people and new influences were having a great effect on the young people, who were of special concern to Elias and Sally. The key was never being too busy to teach, train, work, and play with your children, no matter what their age. But in 1955, as Mary Jane and Robert Berge were attended by Harlan Anders and Cass, a wind of change was blowing through community and church, and a destructive wind. While Elias and Sally were in Vermont, Hurricane Hazel struck the barn, destroying the attached chicken house. Nobody was hurt, and there was no great loss. The same could not be said the following year. 
Elias received a great personal blow when his boyhood chum, Clayton Grove, took his own life. From boyhood on, Elias said to the family at Clayton's memorial, I had been around Clayton Grove. This is hard for me. I should have words of comfort and consolation, but in this case, words fail. Surely Elias searched his own soul. It seems that in my own life there are ups and downs. So this warning to have victory is for me. Victory only through Christ. Elias must have been aware of his own physical condition at that time. Five months later, he preached on God's divine healing experienced in my life after receiving 30 x-ray treatments to his throat in six weeks. Cancer was restricting his eating and breathing and made his neck appear thick. Still, he traveled thousands of miles that year, visiting 1W sites. At the beginning of January 57, the Graybrooms Meats operation moved to its new shop up at the corner. In February, Elias and brother-in-law I.T. Landis left by train to visit Sally's brother Melvin in Florida in hope that the sun and air would have a positive effect on Elias's throat. A few weeks later, Guy Hevner drove Sally down in Elias's Plymouth. So many well-wishers and friends stopped by to see Elias that he had to talk much more than he wanted to. In March, Elias and Sally drove home, their car packed with fruit. The next five months brought a series of electrical and injection treatments at a clinic in Wilkes-Barre. Elias had great faith in his doctors, but refused their recommendations of surgery. Family and friends would drive him to his treatments. Pappy went along on one trip to see the tunnel on the new Northeast Extension. By April, Elias was only able to eat soft foods and drink eggnog, but he was still working in the garden. I.T. and Susan Landis took him to a clinic in Portage, Pennsylvania, making it back by 5 p.m. the next day for the big open house at Graybrooks. Elias wrote of his condition in a letter to a man whose recovery from throat cancer he had read of in a newspaper. By morning, I hardly know how to get a little water in to get started. One day it seems it's going good and for the better, then the next day is just the opposite. Sunday, the 21st of July, there was a special service for Elias at Salford with the congregation singing, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. On Monday evening, the family knew Elias had to go to the hospital. The next morning, he walked out to meet Abe in the lane to go to Grandview. At 5.30 Wednesday morning, he died. There were 1,450 people at Elias' view. Next year, men of the congregation brought their tractors to the farm. Sally wrote, I look over the fields with tear-dimmed eyes, reminded that brotherly love still continues. And now, Sally was left alone to raise her three youngest children still at home. In the 37 years remaining to her, she would grow into a special role in her community and family. For many of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren, she would be the soul of the Landis family, and they would know Elias only through her. Though one life had been taken from the home, there was still a great deal of living to be done, and probably not a lot of time alone. Harvey, Dave, and Denny Swartley might bring something they thought Sally would be interested in. Emma and Cass might be working late into the night preparing Christmas baskets. That year, J.R. and Glenda were back from 1W service in New York, and in 1960, they brought with them little Kevin to meet his great-grandmother Emma. That was three years before his back problems would develop. Mammy remained productive in her old age, as when helping Eva Aldifer make mincemeat at Graybrooms. Pappy Aldifer could likewise be counted on for helping in the butcher house trimming beef. Ruthie married Wilson Swartley in 1959, leaving Susan to help with her mother's hair. She too would be gone in a few years when she married John Merrill Souter. But if some were leaving, why wasn't the house getting any emptier? Sally's diaries record an endless succession of family and other visitors. Who was there for what meal? At Christmas, everyone was there, and every year a cousin or two was added. Mel and Nestor's youngest, was one of the last to be held by Mammy Landis. After Lizietta's mother died in 1963, she moved in with her sister-in-law and nieces. Shortly before Philip Aldifer died two years later at age 97, all of his children gathered for a picture, Jake, Sally, Louie, Melvin, Lizzie, and Susan. 
Pappy kept busy in his late years with gardening and the many scrapbooks he loved to pore over. Jim was the last to leave the nest, marrying Beverly Durstein in 1964. How could she resist a fellow with such a fine set of wheels? The family circle continued to widen. Harvey led Sally in singing with a group of grandchildren that would eventually number 37. They in turn would, by 1995, bear 60 great-grandchildren and three great-great-grandchildren. What is mush, and what do you do with it? How many grandchildren can answer? Sally had a little home industry, cooking up cornmeal and water and pouring it into pans and packaging it for people to fry for breakfast. Lizietta took a job at Grandview Hospital, working full-time until she was 70, then part-time till age 78. She was one quarter of the household, with Emma, Sally, and Cass, that would keep the glow alive in the heart of the homestead a home full of smells, tastes, sounds, and sights that each generation could come to and know in their turn, where you could be surrounded and overwhelmed by a sense of family and life that stretched back through time and gave assurance to the future, a place to sit in the lap of dignity, conviction, and love. In the hearts and minds of her grandchildren, like Lori and Mike, Sally would remain a constant. As they grew older, Grammy remained the same. Her appearance, the genuineness of her love and concern, the words that she spoke, her embrace, would stay in their memories as a blessing. And no visit to Grammy was complete without a spirited game of scamper. At age 81, Sally's ministry extended into the Greater Ford Prison. There she received a blessing by simply being for these men what she was for a lifetime, mom. In her old age, Sally took pride in being a help to Emma and Cass with the housework making washcloths for the kitchen at Christopher Dock, or helping to make Fosnock donuts. At Salford, Sally and Lizietta, with their plain dress, were a visual reminder of a generation that was not ashamed of its love for the church, and how many people were touched by the hand that wouldn't let go, and her words of acceptance. Sally prayed for many people, but for none more than her own family, who knew well her expressions of faith. How wonderful it is to walk with Jesus every day allowing him to choose a path and let him plan the way. How wonderful it is to know that he will be our guide and understand he will always be right there at your side. And when the walk is ended, to know that you can hear Jesus say, Dear child, you know I promise to go with you all the way. That meant a lot to me and I will mean something to you. As Sally's walk neared its end, she would often say what could be a difficult thing for some who had grown up with her. We must learn to accept change. That feeling can only come from a spirit of faith and acceptance. And so as the time came to say goodbye to her family, friends, and this earth, the glory gates would open wide, and Sally could say, It is well with my soul. exactly how heaven works, but I like to think that at last, Grammy is back with Grandpa. I look down a long lane and there they are, sitting on a porch, 
holding hands on a glider at a place that looks remarkably like the land is home. There's a gentle breeze blowing, ringing the wind chimes hanging on the porch. The rock garden is in full bloom and the birds are singing. They are speaking in Dutch. She tells him about the church and about each of their 12 children. She shares many memories of all the joy she received from their grandchildren and their families. She describes each of them from the time they were babies, how she made them laugh by playing poor pussy or knock on the door with them, how she read Chicken Little and Goodnight Baby Bear. As they got older, how the grandchildren loved to study where games were stacked on shelves and where they'd play the marble game. She tells of thousands of games of scamper that she played with grandchildren and how she would tease them from ch for chasing her home by saying, now is that kind? She tells him that they were good workers who liked to, to help her make mush, can peaches and pears, freeze corn and green beans and make cinnamon buns. These last few months, we have missed Grammy's hearty hiya when she would greet us on the porch, her hugs and kisses, the way she would hold our hands and pat them, not wanting to let go, the way she would giggle and the twinkle in her eyes, the way her face would brighten up when we would bring our children to see her, and how totally accepted and at home she made us feel. Grammy used to say that we shouldn't say goodbye, but till we meet again. I am sure that she still prays that each of her descendants realizes that if they love Jesus and live for him, that it is not a time to say goodbye to Grammy, but till we meet again. $75 for it and I had it on the attic so now I decided it's time to get it out. I'm going to put it in my bedroom. The big time will be the auction. This is a small thing next to without. Yep. I can see the nose and the eyes. Everybody in one 120, last call. 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 Everybody